Well, this morning, as we turn to God's Word, we're reflecting together on Christmas, and we're gazing together with wonder on the one who was laid in the Bethlehem manger just a little bit over 2,000 years ago. And we're considering Christmas, but instead of immediately turning to the most traditional Christmas passages, which of course would be Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2, we're gazing together on these glorious, uh, the glorious event and meaning of Christ's coming from several different angles on different weeks. And uh, this morning, uh, we're going to be turning to the biblical angle uh, that is found in Philippians 2, chapter 5 through 11, uh, uh, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. And I invite you to, uh, to turn there. And again, we're looking at Christ's coming through a number of different lenses. And uh, this passage, Philippians chapter 2, uh, is often assumed to be likely, uh, though not for sure, an early Christian hymn. In any event, it certainly focuses on the identity of Jesus. So in a sense, it might be fair to call this one of the first Christmas carols ever. I'll read the passage again, Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And if you, uh, you might have noticed as I read the passage that it appears that uh, his first and second comings are linked. Uh, of course, uh, looking to Christ's coming and the humility of his coming and ultimately then his cross, but then also his resurrection and uh, the, the, the exaltation of Christ. And when I think of the first and second comings of Christ being linked in what may well be a hymn or a song, I think of the words of uh, another hymn that we all probably know quite well, or at least many of us do, Joy to the World. A joy to the World is certainly a Christmas hymn. I'm not uh, disagreeing with that for a minute, but actually it links the first and second comings of Christ. Joy to the World, the Lord has come, looks back to Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, I fully agree. But do you, uh, think about the lines, no more let sin and sorrows grow, far as the curse is found. Looks forward in anticipation uh, to his promised and glorious return. Uh, looking back to Christ's first coming and forward in expectation of his promised and glorious second coming. Well, with that in mind, uh, this passage here in Philippians chapter 2 Uh, these words shine the spotlight on Jesus. And in so doing, uh, they give us much-needed perspective on the manger in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago. Uh, This passage focuses first on the humility of Christ and then on His exaltation. This passage gazes on the Savior from His coming to His cross. And ultimately then, of course, the resurrection. But let's Uh, Jump in together and look at verses 5 through 8 at the beginning. And we see that at Christmas we celebrate that the King of glory was born as a baby and laid in a Bethlehem manger. Now again, many Bible scholars believe that this is an early Christian hymn focusing on Christ. Uh, That said, we don't know for sure. But in any event, this is a glorious reflection on Christ. In the words of the first half of the passage, that's verses 5 through 8, provide a powerful commentary on Christmas. These verses bring us face to face with the humility of Christ's coming, with the humility of Christmas. Think about it. The eternal Son of God. The second person of the Trinity, who is Himself God, the agent of creation, came to our sin-sick, fallen world and became human. The eternal Son of God stepped into time. 
Think of his pre-existence. Think he is fully God. God is eternal. Now think of him stepping into our shoes, so to speak, and being born and laid in a Bethlehem manger. He has always been, theologians rightly, rightfully uh, throughout church history says we mu- that there was never a time when he was not. I'll say that again. There was never a time when he was not. The first verses of the Gospel of John say this with incredible clarity. In the beginning was the Word. And notice that word, capital W. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This is who Jesus is, the Word. And with that in mind, we come face to face with the reality that Christ did not cling to His heavenly position. Ponder the fact that He certainly did not deserve to be subject to all of our human frustrations and experiences. Friends, I'll state the obvious. God does not deserve to experience hunger, thirst, exhaustion, or sadness. But Christ did not grasp at or cling to His heavenly position. Instead, He made Himself a humble servant. The New International Version translates part of verse 7 saying this, He made Himself nothing. The ESV translates the words, He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. You could also translate the word servant, slave. Throughout history, theologians have put it this way, remaining who he was, God, he became what he was not, man, to save us. You say that boggles my mind. Amen. It should. Gazing with wonder on Christ's coming, on the incarnation, is absolutely mind-blowing and out to call us to worship. What our Savior did so that we can be saved. Think about it. He, you could say it this way. He gave up His privilege. He didn't cling to or exploit what rightfully belonged and belongs to Him for personal gain. And Christ's choice not to cling to all the privileges that are rightfully His has been termed the divine no. In other words, He said no to clinging to and exploiting His heavenly position or holding on to it as his, uh, to His own advantage. And He said yes to humbling Himself. He said yes to being born as a baby and being laid in Bethlehem in a manger. He said yes to going to the cross and dying a criminal's death as our substitute. And he said yes to conquering sin and death through his death and ultimately, of course, his victorious resurrection. Now, Bible scholars have pointed out the contrast between Adam, on the one hand, our father way, way back, right? Uh, The first man, Adam, and Christ. Think about this for a minute. Uh... Adam grasped at being like God. Do you remember the lie in the garden? Your your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. So Adam and his wife Eve, of course, grasped at being like God. That was at the heart of the rebellion of eating the forbidden fruit. Adam and Eve uh, attempted to take for themselves what did not belong to them, right? So reaching out and taking that fruit in the garden was them attempting to take what did not belong to them in rebellion against God, the the entrance of sin. Well, Christ, Christ, on the other hand, did not grasp at what did and does belong to Him. Now, throughout history, there have been many errors that people have fallen into when talking about the glorious truth of Christ's coming. And I think it's worth uh, pausing here and, and, and thinking about this a little bit. When some read these words, they wrongly, and let me make sure you hear the word wrongly, they wrongly assume 
that Jesus must have emptied himself of his divinity, of being God. In other words, he must have been sent by God, but was not God himself. And you say, I don't know anyone that thinks that way. Oh, I'm sure you do. The cults teach this. Many cults throughout history have taught this. And in uh, popular, lines of reason, uh, popular lines of reasoning that say Jesus was a great moral teacher, but nothing more, follow that line of reasoning. Or Islam, Jesus views Jesus as a prophet, but not God. And to this error, we must absolutely respond, absolutely not. Anyone who reads the Gospels, the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, can see the full divinity and the full humanity of Jesus. Without question, Jesus had the full range of human experience. Think with me just for a minute. He got hungry, thirsty, tired, even angry, I would point out, without sinning, by the way. He even wept. Kids, have you memorized one of the shortest verses in the Bible, John eleven thirty five? 35? Jesus wept. And that was surrounding the death of his friend Lazarus. But that's not all. He also worked miracles, including walking on water and calming the storm and even raising the dead. And of course, the culmination of the Gospels describes his own resurrection from the dead. Someone who is simply a great moral teacher does not prove their authority over nature and even over death itself. Jesus was and is fully God and fully man. And this, in the language of theology, has been known throughout history as the Incarnation. Now, uh, I talked about the one great error on the one side of the equation, which kind of which downplays or even denies Jesus Christ being fully God. A, a terrible error. But there's a terrible error on the other side, too. And the other error often, uh, puts, that often puts in an appearance is denying his full humanity. And this is just as dangerous, just in a different way. Second uh, John, verse 7, only one chapter in Second John says this, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So denying Jesus' humanity earns what titles? Deceiver and Antichrist. That's fairly forceful, would you agree? Actually, that's extremely forceful. And some of us are probably thinking and maybe wondering, I get that denying that he is God is a huge problem. But why is his humanity so vitally essential? Well, think with me for a moment here. You can't crucify an illusion. Would you agree that's true? Think with me about it. You can't crucify an illusion. And that means if Jesus only appeared human, then his birth and his death are without meaning. Jesus' humanity is is absolutely essential for us to be saved. Jesus had to be made like us in every way. He suffered as we suffer. He was tempted as we are tempted, though I would quickly point out that he did not succumb to, to, to temptation. He, Jesus, and Jesus alone is perfectly without sin. Hebrews 2.17 puts it this way, Therefore he, talking about Christ, had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And propitiation is a fancy word. It's a big word, but it's worth maintaining. A sacrifice turning aside the wrath of God. That is justly upon us because of our sin, and Jesus made propitiation, his sacrifice, turned aside the wrath of God that is justly upon us. 
we need to reflect with wonder on the Incarnation. Jesus is the perfect God-man. 100% God, 100% man, fully God, fully man. He was born as a baby and laid in a Bethlehem manger, humbly giving up the position he rightfully deserved. He came to earth, was born as a baby, and lived a perfect life, experiencing everything we humans experience. And as the creator and owner, and owner of the universe, this is not what he deserves, deserved and deserves. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is a window looking out over Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. It's a window looking on Christmas. And with that, I want to turn to the traditional Christmas passage, Luke 2, 1 through 7. And as I read these words that are much more commonly read at Christmas, think about the picture that we just read here in Philippians 2 and see how it sheds light on what, we're, what is described here. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Did you notice that there's not as much detail here as we often fill in? I don't see the innkeeper of the, uh, you know, the typical Christmas pageants here. Uh, I don't see the, uh, th but we are told there was no room in the inn. There was no guest room, no other place to stay. And so they stay where there was a manger. And mangers are feeding troughs for animals. And so presumably this was, there were animals all around. Tradition suggests a cave. It could have even been open air. We really don't know for sure. Anyway, the circumstances were beyond humble. You know, it's, it's familiar, and we look at it, and we sometimes miss that. Beyond humble. Verses 6 and 7 of Luke 2. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Think about it. At his birth, there was no room, so he's wrapped in cloths. He's laid in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. But that's not all. We also read that Joseph was from the line of King David. And that's why they were in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was, of course, David's hometown. And a Roman census caused Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem, but really it was God's perfect plan. God was working out and putting into motion His perfect plan to send His Son. Now, when we read God's Word, it is a good, a good thing to do. It's a good discipline uh, when we read a passage to say, what does this teach us about God? And as we pause and read this passage, it's well worth asking, do I have eyes to see God working in the circumstances right behind the scenes? Right behind the scenes. Uh, think about it. It was promised in the Old Testament that a king from David's line would sit on the throne forever. But here we see God working in the affairs of nations to accomplish his perfect purposes. Caesar thought he was in control, but the picture is so much bigger. There was a census. And you know what? The one who was born king was born in Bethlehem, not Nazareth just as the prophets were told, just as had been promised. Jesus is the promised king who will rule forever, coming from the line of David. But the circumstances surrounding his birth are not how you would, ex uh, would expect uh, to welcome the birth of the king of kings. We sometimes picture this scene in a way that can blind us to significant truth. We have flawless and beautiful nativity scenes, and please understand, I'm thankful for that. We have uh, some right here. 
Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus all looking great. Yet I think sometimes we need a reality check. I'm sure that if there were animals, it would have been dirty, loud, and smelly. Uh, These humble circumstances were not ideal. They were anything but ideal. To us, these circumstances would be nothing short of alarming. I like the song Silent Night, don't get me wrong, but I'm pretty sure the night wasn't silent. As a matter of fact, I know it wasn't because the angelic, uh, the heavenly host, the angelic host certainly wasn't silent, that's for sure. And the song Away in a Manger has the line that can't be right, little Lord Jesus, no crying he made. I'm confident Jesus cried and any suggestion to the contrary would cast doubt on his full humanity. Wouldn't you agree? I bring all of this up because we need to be reminded of the messiness of his coming. An airbrushed image of Bethlehem doesn't fill us with hope as it should. And the incarnation is a source of rock-solid hope. When we gaze on the nature of the incarnation, we know that God understands. He's not distant distant or disinterested. He knows our struggles and pain, and he never wonders what that feels like. Now, I'd like you to think with me uh, a reality that is often a common uh, common objection to believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is this feeling, and it's, it's a wrong feeling, by the way. It's a very wrong feeling. But it's this feeling that God, if there's a God, he must be like really far away, like 10 million miles or something like that. Like incalculably far away. He doesn't understand my pain. He doesn't understand what I'm going through. And he, he doesn't get it. Do you know anyone who struggled with that? Well, if there's a God, he's distant and disinterested and doesn't know what I'm going through. When we gaze on the nature of the incarnation we see that God has identified with us. He never wonders what that feels like. Listen again to Philippians 2, 5-7. through Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though He was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. At Christmas, we celebrate that Christ humbly gave up the position that he rightfully deserved and deserves as God. And he came to earth and was born in the humblest of circumstances and was laid in a Bethlehem manger. He lived a perfect life and experienced everything we humans experience. Christ set aside the position of heavenly glory. And was right, uh, that was rightfully His, and came and lived among us. But that's not all. These amazing verses tell us about Jesus. In verse 8, we come face to face with the truth that the path from the manger runs to the cross, to the point of death by crucifixion. And crucifixion was so barbaric that it wasn't even practiced on citizens of Rome. And our word excruciating means out of or from the cross. It was so awful. There's a song that I heard years ago, more of a contemporary song, and it says this. It had this line that was really, really captured me. He made a way in a manger to make a way to the cross. He made a way in a manger to make a way to the cross. He laid down his life to save us. Our Savior humbled himself. Christ's example of love and self-sacrificing humility is nothing short of of mind-blowing, and make no mistake about it, without it we could not be saved. Love moved him to come and go all the way to the cross. Now with that in mind, we need to see that gazing on the humility of Christmas motivates us to demonstrate the same humility. The humility, this humility is found in looking to our Savior. Look again at verse 5. The New International Version translates it this way. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Christ shows us the path of putting others first.
Our attitudes, our mindset as followers of Christ needs to be the same as Christ's attitude. And here in his example, calling us to practice humility of humbly following in Jesus' footsteps. Think about it. The importance of maintaining a loving unity in the local church can't be overstated. And in order for such humility to exist, we need to consider others better than ourselves. And that includes when we've been wronged or offended or when we disagree. Obviously, Jesus has treated us all better, infinitely better, than we deserve. Now, if you look at the context of Philippians, one of the things we quickly see in Philippians is that clearly there were disagreements and even arguments within the church. And Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was saying, command these people to agree with one another, to get along, to have the same mindset as Christ Je- of Christ Jesus. In this early Christian hymn, assuming that's what it is, but anyway, this glorious reflection on Christ that we're looking at here at Christmas is actually an illustration saying, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who put others before himself. You do the same. And flowing out of this truth, we're enabled to treat others with humility. When we find ourselves thinking, I don't want to treat them better than they deserve, we need to look to Christmas. Uh, I, I have sat in my office over the years and I've heard it said, I don't want to treat them better than they deserve. Have you been there? I don't want to treat that person better than they deserve. And often... When I hear something like this, sometimes I respond and sometimes I just think it, but it's, are you a Christian? I don't want to treat them better than they deserve. Are you a Christian? We follow our Savior who did not demand what He deserves. And we ought not to demand what we deserve. Christ laid aside what was rightfully His and humbly put others before Himself. Think the manger and the cross. But that's not the end of the story. That's the humility of Christmas. But this passage, looking gloriously on Christ, takes us a step farther and turns to Jesus' exaltation. We must not leave Him in the manger. He is the King of glory. After humbly living a perfect life and dying a criminal's death, Jesus is exceedingly exalted. He is the King of glory. Obviously, Christ's humility and His coming as a baby that we celebrate at Christmas is not the end. Wouldn't you agree? Jesus rose victoriously from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and today He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is on the throne. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I don't know if you caught it, but in verse 9 it says that God exalted Him. And that's a good translation, but... Uh, the words are hard to translate a little bit, and I want to translate it or paraphrase it a little bit klutzily. God hyper-exalted him or super-exalted him. It, it is words full of passion. Exalted isn't enough. It's super or hyper-exalted. Jesus is exalted far above anything we can even begin to imagine. Jesus Christ accomplished his mission and has been given the name that is above every name. And this is a reference to the title Lord, which ascribes to Jesus the divine name Yahweh in the Old Testament. Jesus is Lord. And friends, the day is swiftly coming when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus wins. And ultimately, either willingly or unwillingly, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is glorious truth. At His glorious return, there will be no question as to His Lordship. There will be no doubt. It will be universally acknowledged. And this is comforting and joy-filled perspective for everyone who is a believer. And friends, this glorious day, this glorious end is coming soon. But ask yourself, and this is very, very important, we all need to ask ourselves this, will I be bowing my knee willingly or grudgingly? You see, on the day of our death or Jesus' return, whichever comes first, it will be eternally too late 
to commit to Christ. So if you are ready to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, do it today. Don't put it off. I want to think about the great Christmas carol, What Child Is This? It's so helpful that it was actually the prelude. I didn't know that. It's interesting to see how God works. But think about the second verse of the song, What Child Is This? Why lies he in such mean estate, where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christian fear for sinners here. The silent word, and again, word capitalized, capital W, is pleading. Nail's spear shall pierce him through. The cross he bore for me, for you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. With those words in mind and with what we've considered this morning, I'd encourage every one of us to personally ask and seek to answer a couple of questions. Is my perspective on Christmas far too narrow and small? Does my vision need to be stretched? And that's the goal of this series, really. It's not just to zoom in on Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2, as glorious as they are, but to zoom out and say, response, a response of woe and wonder. To pause and say, this is mind-blowing what God has done to save us, what we celebrate at Christmas. Does my vision of Christmas need to be stretched? You see, it's not enough to enjoy the season and get in the Christmas spirit. We need to gaze with wonder on God's plan to send His Son to save. We need to both ask and answer the question, what child is this? And our picture of Christmas can become distorted by the traditions and busyness of the season. Ask yourself, is my perspective on Christmas far too small, far too narrow? Last week, we looked at Galatians 4, uh, verses 4 and 5, a window looking on Christmas. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And now we're looking through another window. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to His own advantage. Rather, He made Himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. That's the New International Version. One more question. Where does my own story intersect with the story of Christmas? The story of God sending His Son to save. We all need to ask and answer the question, what's my response to the Savior? Am I a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? If yes, praise God. This Christmas, let's worship Him with wonder and joy. Everything we've talked about this morning, gazing on the Incarnation, should prompt us to respond with wonder and joy that moves us right into worship, right? But maybe you can't say that your story has personally intersected with the story of Christmas in this way. You can turn your life over to the Lord Jesus right now. In this morning, worship King Jesus. Tell Him that you are a sinner and ask Him to save you. Tell Him in your own words that you receive Him as your Savior. That you see now why He came and not only came, but went to the cross to die as our substitute, paying the penalty for our sins. Tell Him that you're surrendering your life to Him, that you will follow Him. Friends, Christ came to save us from our sins. And His birth in Bethlehem was a culminating moment in God's plan to send the rescue. The song that the kids sang, 1 John 4.14. And we have seen 
and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. That's Christmas. And and saying the word rescue reminds us of something. It reminds us of the peril that is universal to the human condition ever since Adam and Eve. Friends, the reality of sin. We have been created to glorify our Creator. We have been created to worship our Creator. We've been created to know and have a relationship with our Creator. But sin broke that relationship. And God the Father sent His Son. He came and was born in the humblest of circumstances. Born in Bethlehem, King David's hometown, but not in a palace. No, he was born into a poor family. And laid, not in a cradle, but a feeding trough for animals. A manger. He came and experienced... Everything that we experience. Yet He was and is perfectly without sin. And because of that, because He perfectly succeeded where we all fail, He, Jesus, and Jesus alone did not deserve to die for sins. Because he was and is perfectly sinless. Yet, he lived a perfect life that we don't live. We're not perfect. That led all the way to the cross. Where he willingly carried our sins and paid the penalty that we deserve for our sins. Past, present, and future. That all who place their faith and trust in him alone, the gift must be received but that all who receive Him as Savior can be forgiven. Can have a right relationship with God. Be reconciled with God. The relationship we were created to have. But sin broke. Can have eternal life. Certainty of heaven. This is the message of Christmas. Gazing on the incarnation. Gazing on Christ coming. To save us. Again, ask yourself as we close, and I'm going to pray, where does my story intersect with the Christmas story? And if you're saying, I haven't yet personally received that message, today could be the day where you do that in your own words even right now. Or perhaps, you need to talk, welcome to talk to me, talk to someone else. Talk to someone. Don't leave. Today, without receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, if you're ready. This message is the greatest gift. The most glorious news the world has ever known and will ever know. The news of salvation from our sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for sending Your Son. For sending the Lord Jesus. So that we can be saved. And Lord, we pray that as we gaze on the wonder of the One who was born King, as we gaze with wonder on the Savior, fully God and fully man, coming to the sin-sick fallen world for us and for our salvation, Lord, may that move us to respond in worship. And we pray it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.